So next up, I hope and I pray, <laughs> is Senator Ron Johnson. Uh, Senator Johnson, I, I believe you can hear me. I apologize for the switching of order because of the technical challenges, but I believe we have you now and we can hear you. So I'm hoping, well, first off, I'm grateful that you took time to, to speak with us today, and I'm hoping you can comment a little bit about your thoughts about healthcare policy and reform and how to control costs or, or any other topic that you wanna start with and then, and then we'll field questions. So Senator Johnson, um, I believe you are live, I hope. So. Well, good morning, can you hear me this time? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. There's always little technical difficulties. Medicine is not the only complex uh, business. <laughs> uh, let, let me first, tell the group, you know, why I even got involved in politics and really started back in 1983 when we had our, our daughter born who had trans, transposition of the great arteries. And, you know, I saw the marvel of American medicine, uh, but I also came to understand the, the validity of the term medical practice uh, with, with an emphasis on practice. Uh, what we've seen, I, uh, you know, the, the previous speaker was talking about uh, Dr. Autonomy. Uh, we've seen the politicization during COVID of, of medicine. I think it's a, a real tragedy. Uh, certainly from, from my standpoint, I, I want to see doctors be doctors to, to allow them to practice medicine. Uh, with something like COVID, to be able to explore different ther therapies and different theories and then utilize the, the power of, of the information age and the internet <clears throat> to disseminate the information, uh, disseminate the, the science, uh, realizing that uh, nothing's ever perfect. But I think... It, <laughs> I think in your opening comments, you talked about the, there's never been price transparency. Uh, there actually has. Uh, way back before World War II, before we started transitioning to the third party payer system, uh, I would say probably more than 80% uh, of healthcare spending was actually paid directly by the patient. And you know, my background is in manufacturing. Actually, uh, produce medical or packaging for medical devices, like endoscopic surgery devices. And so you, you realize there's a way to solve a problem. And it's about gathering information, it's trying to do root cause analysis, uh, based on all that information, proper definition of the problem, then you establish some, some achievable goals. Well, from my standpoint, with a very complex system, a very complex business that medicine is, uh, you need to try and simplify the problem. And I, I think it is rel relatively simple. It's that we have separated the consumer of the product from the payment of the product. You know, why are costs out of control? Because we by and large have removed the discipline of free market competition by having somebody else pay for services and products that we all expect perfection on. And so I think the solution lies in reconnecting the consumer of the product with the payment of the product. Uh, make sure that people are making wise consumer decisions. Now, it's, it's, it's it is a more complex uh, business model than just going out and buying a car and you know, reading consumer reports. There's no doubt about it. And you need insurance. You need insurance for the catastrophic type of care situations. But for an awful lot of health care, I think consumers ought to be paying those prices directly. Now, uh, the health care system would have, <clears throat> have to learn how to deal with that. Uh, competition is not fun, trust me. In business, I would allow to be a monopolist. I, I didn't like to compete but I had to compete. And because I had to compete, my products were a whole lot better. My customer service was a whole lot better than it would have been had I been a monopolist or had we had a, a system that was designed to be exploited. And that's what we have right now. Uh, drug pricing. I, I, you know, I'm an accountant. I'm a business guy. I, I actually understand uh, business models and distribution systems. For the life of me, I have no idea how we price medicines. You know, the, the uh, pharmacy benefit managers, how, how this has all come about is just bizarre to me. The formularies, and they're, they're just set up, and they, it, you know, somebody, somebody actually does understand these things, and the few people that do know exactly how to exploit them, and that's one of the problems we have. I'll leave on this note, because I think mean, information and data is something we don't, uh, uh, particularly in Congress, we, we don't like numbers very much. People like words, people like rhetoric, people like demagoguery. Well, let me just give you a couple numbers. Uh, the best I can determine, the best, we probably spend no more than about $500 billion out of the $3.7 trillion spend in 2018 on drugs, 500 billion. Now, it would be generous to assume drug companies make a 20% after-tax profit. That's $100 billion. Um, 
So, so let's, let's, let's assume they really are profitable on an after tax basis of $20 billion. That would mean they're making $100 billion of profit out of a 3.7 or $3,700 billion healthcare spend. Uh, the problem isn't high drug prices. Uh, the problem would become if we drive every profit incentive out of the drug industry to innovate and create new life-saving drugs, that would be a problem. Uh, just squeezing $100 billion out of $3.7 billion is not the solution. And yet, the rhetoric, the demagoguery, certainly plays in well to beating up on drug companies and pharmaceutical companies. I realize I'm a real outlier uh, in Congress and probably in the political realm on this, but I actually want to look at real solutions. Uh, I am very thankful that doctors dedicate their lives to saving other people's lives. I have a daughter who's living now, 37 years old, her heart operates backwards because of, of the surgeon that rebaffed the upper chamber of her heart at the age of eight months. I've got a great deal of respect for American medical system. It is the best in the world. It's the most expensive, but we don't have a healthcare crisis. We have a healthcare financing problem, and that's what we really need to, to uh, address. And from my standpoint, the simple way of addressing it is, again, bring in the benefits of a free market competitive system, uh, reconnect the consumer of the product with the payment of the product. That's with high deductible insurance, with health savings accounts, which we're going to have to do because, let's face it, Americans have gotten used to the fact that they don't really have to pay for health care. They got to pay for insurance and they hate it, or they want to offload that on, on government or somebody else. But we need to get consumers involved in this equation if we're ever going to control costs. That's what a free market system does, and it does it beautifully. Excellent point. Um, I want to field questions. Actually, what I want to do is talk for about 15 minutes about what you just said, but that's not what the audience wants. So, so uh, thank you, Senator Johnson. Do we have any questions from the audience, either in person or virtual? Otherwise, I'm sure I can come up with something, but for, for the Senator. I'll, I'll start. So, um, there have been some executive orders recently. You, you talked about the the PBMs and drug prices. And we did have a conference last year where, where we had uh, somebody from Pfizer speaking about how about half of the cost of drugs is all the middlemen after the, the pharmaceutical company that spends 10 years and a billion dollars making the drug. And about half of the profit after that comes from the PBMs and the middlemen. And there have been all kinds of cases, especially out of Ohio, that have illustrated how that lack of transparency is being gamed with rebates and things like that because people can't see what's going on and the PBMs in that case are making a lot of money. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts about some of what the Trump administration is proposing around drug pricing? I know he's proposing a lot, but one of the things that he's talking about is more transparency in the rebate system to eliminate some of the, 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 the price uh, gouging by middlemen because of lack of transparency? Well, again, I wish I could explain it to everybody, but I don't fully understand it myself, even though I've attempted a number of times. I've sat down with CEOs of the generic drug companies, other drug companies, run, you know, run, run me through this, you know, try and explain this to me. And again, I'm an accountant. I'm a business guy. I understand that. But there's no doubt about that uh, you need distribution systems and distributors ought to be able to make a, a fair profit. Something has gone haywire here, and I, I, I just have to believe, you know, it's, it's the, the Medicare formularies. Uh, again, that's set up because we have this third-party payer system for seniors, and government is trying to control things. And so when government tries to control something that they really have no capability of controlling, they screw it up. Uh, again, there's so much rhetoric, so much demagoguery. I mean, there are other things about drug reimportation. Uh, it sounds good. You know, you can get a drug cheaper in Canada, so let's just reimport it from there. Well, the supply wouldn't be up in Canada for us to supply the American market, so that's not going to work. Right. Uh, drug companies aren't stupid. They're not going to keep sending drugs to a foreign country where you have price controls. And by the way, where they don't have access to all the drugs because you have the drug controls, uh, you have the price controls. So, you know, I don't have a great deal of faith in, in politicians in Washington, D.C. being able to really analyze this properly step outside the rhetoric and demagoguery and actually fix this within the completely broken bureaucratic uh, third party payer system we have. Um, it's a real problem. I, I, I don't know how you dismantle it to get to the point where I think we need to go if we really have free market competition in here. Uh, 
with you know Medicare being such a large uh, payer of health care and then everything else being in uh, insurance you know, one good thing about Obamacare trust me consumers don't like this but it moved to higher deductible plans that wasn't its intent it's certainly the result uh, we should really key on that and figure out a way then of, of, you know, how do you provide individuals again with those uh, you know th things like health savings accounts where they can start paying for things directly themselves so again I, I I don't believe these uh, executive orders are going to be implemented. I, I know there's lawsuits against them anyway. I don't believe, honestly, that most of those solutions are actually going to work because they're not fully analyzing the problem. Uh, they don't, they're not, again, they're based on rhetoric and demagoguery, something that sounds good versus something that actually works. Right. Well, your, your point about, you know, importing drugs from Canada is, is, is an excellent point, and, that, and that's, I I hesitate to say I'm citing a person from Pfizer because I'm going to disengage like half the people, but, but he made a good point, which is what you said, which is Canada is not going to supply the U.S. with drugs. They're going to whatever is needed by Canadians. So, so they don't want this to happen either because the pharmaceutical companies are only going to give them enough to satisfy their own needs and they're going to prioritize Canadians over us. So, so really what we're doing is temporarily importing Canadian price controls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can, can I also add, I mean, here we are in COVID. We're hoping that somebody develops a vaccine. Who are we going to rely on to develop that vaccine? Yeah. Well, pharmaceutical companies. Well, in order for pharmaceutical companies to have the resources to do something like this, um, they're going to have to make a profit. And right. as I point out, from my standpoint, the profit, again, even if it's at a very high level, it's, 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 chump change in terms of our total health care spend. So why do we focus on that? Well, because they're, they're a good target. They're, they're a good boogeyman that, people, that politicians go after. It would be very destructive to our healthcare system and very destructive to innovative uh, therapies and, and drugs in the future. I personally would rather take a pill and get cured as opposed to have to go in for surgery. I, I'm actually a cheerleader for pharmaceutical industry. Not saying that they're perfect from a long, by a long shot, but I actually want to see drug companies succeed in producing more life-saving drugs. Yeah. Well, you need to, you need to encourage that innovation and it, it takes 10 years and over a billion dollars. So you need to allow them to recover that at least and maybe make some profits. <laughs> um, so you, uh, so I'm waiting for questions. Uh, let me see. I have a Q and a here Are there, um, if there are any questions, uh, let me ask you also, uh, well, just a general question, and then I want to comment on the HSAs and all of that, but, but how do we get past this polarization in politics so that we, don't you think that in order to get something passed, whether we're deregulating or adding regulations, we need some sort of bipartisan compromise? How do we, this is like maybe an hour long discussion, how do we, how do we facilitate that? Let's just say with healthcare. How do we work towards bipartisanship or is it just too polarized and maybe we have to wait until after the election for that kind of idealistic thinking? Because I don't think we're going to pass anything unless there's some piece of what we're talking about that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. Yeah, so if you use the word, you use the word compromise. I always try and use the word areas of agreement. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm Chairman Homeland Security Government Affairs. We've passed and has signed a law over hundred bills coming through my committee it's generally not through compromise although that, that's the very tail end of the, of the process generally what we do is we go through the problem solving process We're, we first identify a problem we gather the information and all along the way we go okay do you agree that's a problem okay do, do you agree that this this is kind of the root cause of it okay uh, do you agree that this is an achievable solution okay then, then you start developing solutions what happens in in washington dc and healthcare is a perfect example of this is before anybody's gone through that, that rigorous problem solving process, they already have a solution. You know, like, again, something that sounds really good. Let's, let's just reimport drugs from Canada. Yeah, but that's not gonna work because Canada does, does not have enough drugs and the drugs that we'd wanna reimport, the drug companies aren't stupid enough to send so much into Canada that they can reimport and undercut their pricing. So, right. you know, from my standpoint, it really is going through the problem solving process, lay out the facts, make sure that we understand you know, exactly what we're talking about, which is why I highlighted, you know, how, how many people have you talked about or have you heard talk about the 
you know, macro profits of the drug companies. If you talk that way, you can very, I, I think it's pretty obvious to say, well, that's really not going to be the solution to solving our, our healthcare cost problems, just squeezing out every means of, you know, every dollar of profit out of, out of the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, again, it's going through that problem solving process, agreeing on the information, you know, facts do matter if they're ever used, but we rarely, we rarely use facts in the political realm, uh, much to my chagrin, much to my frustration. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I'm breaking any rules by this, but please share that book, Purple Solutions, with your colleagues, because there's a bunch of facts in there. <laughs> Dr. Watchmaker, do. You, have a, you have a question? Uh, yeah, maybe. Is there a mic for Dr. Watchmaker? Yeah. So we do have a question from the audience here, and then I have a, a couple in the Q&A that I see as well. So Dr. Watchmaker, you have a question? Yeah, Senator Johnson, I'm in practice now 20 years, and I'm always interested how, as time goes on, I am uh, given new regulations and new uh, mandates to comply with federally that don't seem to make sense. When Dan asked me to write the book chapter on federal regulation, I was equally surprised to see that there's already a large body of literature doing a look back on prior decades of federal regulation and whether it has been efficient, whether it, it has been life-saving, whether it has been cost-effective. And it's impressive to me how the look back science really shows that these ideas born from smart people with good intentions just keep failing. How do we stop future administrations from feeling that they have the next best idea? Because I've watched now for 20 years those next best ideas not really seem to make sense from the get-go and not be based in underlying uh, uh, science. So, so let me share the insights that I've learned coming from the private sector, going to government, uh, you have legislators. So what do legislators do? They legislate. You have regulators. What do they do? They regulate. I mean, just like a surgeon performs surgery. Uh, so Congress is just a big legislation mill. I mean, trust me, I'm, I'm chairman of committee. I, get, I just get hundreds of pieces of legislation. Most of it never should even see the light of day. And we have to sift through all that. Of course, every piece of legislation has a really nice name on it. You know, a, a name that implies it's going to solve all kinds of problems, and it simply doesn't. You know, I, I often use the uh, analogy of a, of a ship with a bunch of barnacles on it. Uh, those barnacles are slowing down that ship as it's moving through the water. The solution, of course, is to scrape the hull clean and streamline the ship so it can move forward, right? Um, that's what we ought to do. And by the way, that, I would say that's what the Trump administration has done to a certain extent by at least they stopped adding to the regulatory burden, uh, reduced it somewhat. The solution would be to, again, reduce the regulation. But what happens in regulatory agencies and departments and what happens in Congress is they write more regulation, they, they write more legislation, they add barnacles to the, 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 the hull. It's like, oh, I got a new solution, just stick a new barnacle on top. So that is the problem. The solution, from my standpoint, always lies in smart deregulation. You know, let's take a look at what, uh, what is weighing down uh, these processes and, and making it difficult for doctors to be doctors, and let's remove it. Uh, now, I'm not arguing for no regulation. Uh, we obviously want safe drugs, and FDA play, plays a, a real role there, but you know, I'm the guy the champion right to try because the FDA is too risk-averse, and they, they are... Uh, too bureaucratic, and quite honestly, they oftentimes play the, the part of God in making decisions for people that really ought to be those patients and doctors' decisions themselves. So uh, I'm in total agreement with you. We have way too much regulation. We need some, but we could uh, do with a whole lot less. Yeah, and I think, um, and just to add to that, and in, in Dr. Watchmaker's chapter, he talks about how he was not able necessarily to give the best patient care when he's forced to just be compliant with regulations. And it's a matter of, do you want to tr trust the frontline physicians and nurses to do what's best or do you want to tie their hands? But now let me ask a question from, from the audience here from Robert Ross. Uh, he wants to know, how do we balance free market healthcare with the need to provide healthcare access to the uninsured especially seeing as how the uninsured are growing during the pandemic. So how do we balance this need to have free markets competition with, with uh, 
with uh, helping the poor and, and now the uninsured because of um, uh, COVID? Well, of course, we've been trying to do that for decades and we have not succeeded. We still have, you know, millions of people that are uninsured, oftentimes, truthfully, at, at, their, own, at their own option. Um, I, again, I, I think if we fix the financing system in the private healthcare market uh, and had government really just focus on those individuals that don't have health care, we'd probably be, be better off for it. Uh, there's not an easy solution. You know, I don't. I don't want to imply that. You know, but we have government programs. We have Medicaid. We have Medicare. Um, you know, we certainly do everything we possibly can to to make sure that nobody goes untreated. And of course, hospitals themselves uh, bear the brunt of that with the emergency rooms as well. So, uh, right. it, again, Obamacare was supposed to take care of this. It didn't. Um, and again, I'm not being overly critical. I mean, this is just a really complex problem. Uh, that's why I keep going back to you know, trying to simplify it and focus on what the, the real root cause of this is. And it it's really is the third party payer system and the lack of uh, free market discipline in, in as much health care as we possibly could have it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, with regard to your last point there, I'm actually trained as a scientist before I became a business person. So I like data and experiments, kind of hard to do experiments on political policy. Although you could look at what different states are doing, that's federalism. <laughs> look at what other countries are doing or look at what entrepreneurs are doing. And I mentioned earlier, we have Dr. Keith Smith who, who runs the surgery center at Oklahoma. He only takes cash. He does not take insurance. There is no third party payer for the, exactly the reasons you're stating. So the question is, Dr. Keith Smith did the experiment you are talking about. His surgeries are half to one third the price of other surgeries better outcomes, um, and he, he, he's growing and growing. Uh, and, and that's what happens when you have the, the, the buyer, the patient, interact with the provider directly instead of surrogates like government or insurance. That's his argument. In fact, I, I had a little trouble convincing him to come today because towards the end of the session today, I have a safety net discussion about should we provide you know, some sort of government sponsored safety net. And he said, well, I'm not sure I'm gonna be welcome here. <laughs> I said, no, 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 we wanna hear from both sides. <laughs> but with regard to that safety net, cause we are gonna talk about that later. Um, uh, you did mention, you know, we should have HSAs, but then we should have catastrophic insurance. Whether that catastrophic insurance is paid for by government or probably you would prefer by, uh, by the individual or employers, that would introduce free market principles with a safety net because I don't know if people know this and I don't think they believe it, but if you stop using your insurance right now, you will get better care at lower cost. Mm -hmm. It's already out there, but people are so accustomed to being dependent on insurance that they don't even know they can do that. For $75 a month, you can have a direct pay physician 24 seven versus if you go to an emergency room, it's $2,000 because of all the cost shifting in hospitals and things like that. So, so Singapore has healthcare at 2.5% GDP versus our 18% because they have HSAs and they have people buy their own healthcare. So they've introduced market principles. So, so we should look at what states are doing, what other countries are doing that work. Uh, and they're actually evidence of, of what you're saying, Senator Johnson. So. Uh, but this kind of gets the whole safety net discussion is, is maybe the, the trickiest thing for, for a believer in free market principles, because there is another question that is in the same spirit as the previous one. And that is, okay, should there be a uh, government uh, uh, sponsoring of say emergency rooms? And I think the president of the AMA who spoke before you, or actually uh, Dr. McEnany, the former president of the AMA was, was thinking that. She is, I think, somewhat a believer in free market principles, but she's saying maybe we should at least support emergency rooms because that's a catastrophic thing, sort of like your house burning down with a fire or things like that. What are your thoughts about that? That is the question anyways from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> sure, well, first of all, I think everybody wants a strong social safety net. We just do. the. the the problem is how do you design a social safety net that over time doesn't get abused uh, and used by people that, that really don't need it? And I think that's kind of what we're, we're seeing today. Uh, so you, you do want the private sector handling most of this because it'll be just more efficient. And, and again, the innovations, the discounts for cash, I actually had my staff call up 
it's amazing. I mean, it's you, you can get huge discounts if you just walk into a provider and say, I'm just going to pay cash, you're going to pay a whole lot less. Uh, right. You know, th there are a lot more doctors that are just doing it basically, no insurance, just dealing with patients. And there are also a lot of, you know, larger businesses that are, are basically creating walk-in clinics in their own operations because it's a whole lot cheaper than trying to pay one of the hospital associations to do it as well. So there are a lot of innovations in the private sector. Um, but if, if you have a public option, a social safety net that is so attractive and so easy to access, you know, without, uh, you know, requirements and criteria for people that don't need it to use it, uh, it, it gets out of control. So again, I, that's the, the crux, you know, how do you design the system so it's only uh, utilized by people that truly need it, need it and other people can afford to, to pay for the healthcare, they need to do that on their own. Right. Yeah, and that direct pay, paying on their own, is something we're going to hear about in about 40 minutes from David Balad, who's here in person from Texas Public Policy Forum. And he, he is promoting the, the benefits of just working directly with your physician and paying without third-party intermediaries, w which ultimately is going to enable the free market forces you're talking about. So do we have any other questions for the, the senator? Yes, one here. Coming up to the microphone here. Hello, Andy Wire. Uh, thanks, Senator Johnson. Question for you. You asked about the, uh, you know, trying to get consumers more engaged. Can we do a combination between what people put in, away in their health savings account? I mean, I know for myself, I've had a high deductible plan. You, you build up funds over time as you build those and try to combine those that uh, use those to make a direct pay right. and then also use the, what I'm paying for premiums or my employer's paying for premiums to really get that catastrophic. Can't we develop a solution that would be doing something similar to that? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, mean, th I think that is a solution. The, the theory of catastrophic insurance is that it should be just a whole lot cheaper, and it should be. Yeah, and I don't have a complete explanation why Obamacare policies are so expensive. I, I think the main, the main explanation there is, you know, Obamacare policies are really uh, utilized by a very small percent of the American public. Uh, part of Obamacare, and I think we all agree with this, you know, we, we don't want to deny people with pre-existing conditions the capability of accessing health insurance and, and health care. But what we did in, the, fault, in the, the really grotesque, faulty design of Obamacare is that they were requiring the very small percentage of the American population on Obamacare policies, you know, the 5 to 7% of, of, of people on the individual market, to bear the full cost burden of covering people with pre-existing conditions. It's a completely faulty design. Now there's a simple solution. I was trying to push this inside the Republican conference while we were, you know, screwing up, trying to, to, to help fix Obamacare. Now th there was a model in Maine. You know, Maine had a guaranteed uh, issue. They were covering people with pre-existing conditions and just like Obamacare, premiums predictably skyrocketed, double and triple. So what, what Maine did is, is they, came up with a system where they spread out that cost over a bunch of people. And they only allow, they own, they basically put people, I don't, this gets pretty complex in terms of, you know, how Maine solved it, but there are solutions for this. And the solution lies in making sure that everybody pays for the coverage of people with pre-existing conditions as opposed to what's happening right now. So yes, there, there's definitely a way of doing this. Uh, higher deductible plans should cost less and they would cost less if, as, as long as uh, we're all sharing the, the social cost of covering people without coverage and covering people with pre-existing conditions. I think that could work. And I think there's a bipartisan sound to some of what you said. You just have to convince your friends across the aisle. <laughs> so Senator Johnson, I, uh, I think we're out of time, but I'm really grateful for you taking time to speak with us. Um, Hoping you might have a little time to stick around for the next few speakers because I think they have uh, uh, some something to say about what you were talking about. But but thank you again so much for taking time to speak with us. So. Well, pr appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Everybody stay healthy, and I will keep it on. I'll I'll keep listening. So God bless you. Wonderful.